Welcome back to Deep Learning. And today we want to talk about the final part of the architectures. And in particular, we want to look into learning architectures. Also because I'm lazy, so, you know. Okay, part five, learning architectures. Well, the idea here is that we want to have self-developing network structures and they can be optimized with respect to accuracy, floating point operations. And of course, you could simply do that with a grid search, but typically that's too time consuming. Recursive self-improvement, um, that is really the pinnacle of that, where you uh, then not only learn uh, how to improve on that problem and on that, but you also improve the way the machine improves and you also improve the way it improves the way it improves itself. And that was my 1987 diploma thesis, which was all about that. So there have been a couple of approaches to do that. And one of the ideas here in reference 22 is using reinforcement learning. So you train a recurrent neural network to generate model descriptions of networks. And you, you train this RNN with reinforcement learning to maximize the expected accuracy. Of course, there's also many other options. You can do reinforcement learning for small building blocks transferred to large CNNs, genetic algorithms, energy-based, and there's actually plenty of ideas that you could follow. It's, it's pointless to try to tell you what the latest and best version of a, you know, learn to learn model is. But they are all very expensive in terms of training time. And if you want to look into those approaches, you really have to have a large cluster because otherwise you aren't able to actually perform the experiments. So there's actually not too many groups in the world that are able to do such kind of research right now. A good theory of problem solving under limited resources, like here in this universe or on this little planet, has to take into account these limited resources. So you can see that also here many elements that we've seen earlier pop up again. There's the separable convolutions and many other blocks. Here on the left hand side, you see this normal cell with kind of looks like an inception module. If you look at the right hand side, it kind of looks like later versions of the inception modules where you have these separations and they are somehow concatenated and also use residual connections. And this somehow has been determined only by architecture search. Performance for ImageNet is on par with the squeeze and excitation networks with lower computational costs. And yeah, there's also, of course, optimization possible for different size, for example, for mobile platforms. ImageNet, where are we? Well, we see that the ImageNet classification has dropped now below 5% in most of the submissions. Substantial and significant improvements are more and more difficult to show on this data set. And the last official challenge was on CVPR in 2017. It's now continued on Kaggle. There is new data sets that is being generated and is needed. For example, 3D scenes, human level understanding, and those data sets are currently being generated. There's, for example, things like the MS Coco data set or the Visual Genome data set, which have replaced ImageNet as state of the art data set. Of course, there's also different research directions like speed and size of networks for mobile applications. And in these situations, ImageNet may still be a suitable challenge. So let's come to some conclusions. We see that the one by one filters to reduce the parameters and add regularization is a very common technique. Inception modules are really nice because they allow you to find the right balance between convolution and pooling. The residual connections are a recipe that have been used over and over again. And we've also seen that some of the new architectures can actually be learned. So we see that there is a rise of deeper models from five layers to more than a thousand. However, often a smaller net is sufficient. Of course, this depends on the amount of training data. You can only train those really big networks if you have sufficient data. We have 99% of all the data. And we've seen that sometimes 
It also makes sense to build wider layers instead of deep layers. You remember, we've already seen that in the universal approximation theorem, if we had infinitely wide layers, then maybe we could fit everything into a single layer. In the 80s, I thought about how to build this machine that learns to solve all these problems. Okay, so that brings us already to the outlook on the next couple of videos. And what we want to talk about is recurrent neural networks. Mm, recurrent neural networks? You can write them down in five lines of pseudocode. We will look into long short-term memory cells. We will look into truncated backpropagation through time, which is a key element in order to be able to train those recurrent networks. And we finally have a look at the long short-term memory cell, one of the key ideas that have been driven by Schmidt, Huber and Hochreiter. Another idea that came up by Cho are the gated recurrent units, which can somehow be a bridge between the traditional recurrent cells and the long short-term memory cells. Well, let's look at some comprehensive questions. So what are the advantages of deeper models in comparison to shallow networks? Why can we say that residual networks learn an ensemble of shallow networks? You remember, I hinted on that slide. This is a very important one if you want to prepare for the exam. And of course, you should be able to describe bottleneck layers or what is the standard inception module and how can it be improved. I have a lot of further reading, dual path networks. So you can also have a look at the squeeze and excitation networks paper. There is more interesting works that can be found here on Medium and of course mobile nets and other deep networks without residual connections. Of course, I also have plenty of references in this set of slides and you see that this time it's really a lot. So it's not only one or two pages, but we actually have a total of seven reference slides. Wow, quite a bit. I will put it into the description of the video such that you don't have to stop the video all the times. This already now brings us to the end of this lecture and I hope you had fun and looking forward to see you in the next video where we talk about the recurrent neural networks. And I heard they can be written down in five lines of code. So see you next time. Bye bye.